All right, good morning, everyone. And good morning to our students online as well. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer and we'll get into our session. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much for this wonderful time that you've given us to study your word. And even as we learn about the Holy Spirit, I ask, Lord, that you will do our hearts. That, Holy Spirit, you will minister to us, oh God. Everything that we learn about you, Lord, I pray that will be true in our hearts, true in our spirit, oh God. We thank you for this opportunity. Lead us and guide us, oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, chapter 2. Chapter 2 is oh, the person of the Holy Spirit. And I think Pastor Selena has covered most of it. And uh, we'll just pick up from point number G, right? Let's, uh, let's do that. The Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. Now, the topic of this chapter 2 is the person of the Holy Spirit. So we establish the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person, right? He is not wind. He is not fire is not something uh, uh, something that moves about no the holy spirit is a person and as a person he ministers to the spirit that is us inside of us right the holy spirit when we become believers the holy spirit ministers to our spirit right so we looked at these points the holy spirit has an intellect right Point number one, he has an intellect. He, he, can, he thinks and he can put his thoughts into our mind. Right? So, for example, you're reading the scriptures and he may give you a revelation. Intellect. Two, he has a will. The Holy Spirit will, his, he has a will for our lives. And when he speaks to us, he can direct us to a certain path. Many of you have come from different places. You've come to Bangalore. Now, you may have opened up the website. You've seen, okay, All People's Church. Something would have told you, try this out. Or go the step further. Who is that? You feel it's you, but it's also the leading of the Holy Spirit. Right? So he, he sometimes he, he's like a dove. We must remember that, right? He's not going to force his will. He's not going to say, you have to do this. No, he will, he will direct us. Say, okay, this is what I want for you. Why don't you take it up? This is a step in your life that I want to take you. This is the direction for your life. And the Holy Spirit has emotions. He can be loved. He can be grieved. Now, especially uh, as, a, as believers, right, we, we can love on the Holy Spirit. Meaning we can keep talking to him, keep speaking to him. Some of the things I personally do is I keep speaking to the Holy Spirit. And some people uh, you know, ask me, why don't you talk to people? Uh, you never talk to people around. That's, that's who I am. As a person, always been a person who's always to myself. But after becoming a believer, it became worse. Meaning, I wouldn't talk to anyone. Only talking to the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay, all random things, right? It's not like I'm only speaking, okay, you know, Holy Spirit, tell me how heaven is, how is my house in heaven? No. Everything, very simple, right? There could be a time I'm just practicing a song on the guitar and I'm not getting a chord. This has happened many times. And I just feel, oh, this is the chord you can play. And there's nothing very spiritual. But the more you speak to the Holy Spirit, the more he will speak to you. Amen? Right? So think of this. I've used this example many times. Say, for example, there's somebody on the, on the, you know, on the ground floor there. And example is my father, right? And he says, Paul, now I can hear that voice. And I know whose voice is that. Why do I know it? Right? 
I've heard him say it a million times. Paul, come and do this. Paul, it's a, it's a common. So the more I hear the Holy Spirit, the more I'll be familiar with his voice. That's why Jesus says, my sheep will hear my voice. Right? I, I don't know if you've seen this video. It's a very interesting video. This happened in the, you know, uh, it's a WhatsApp video that people share. And this shepherd has a big farm, right? And uh, the sheep are all scattered around grazing. There were two shepherds, right? So one shepherd comes and he begins to call all the sheep. The sheep just look and don't do anything. But this second shepherd, who's the real shepherd of the sheep, begins to call in the same, the same, you know, uh, syllables and all of that. The, the words used are the same. And all the sheep that were scattered, they all come running to the shepherd. What a beautiful example to understand that as believers, we can hear the voice of God. We can. The problem is, we are waiting for the heavens to open and Jesus to come. You shake hands with him and that's not always. He has revealed himself through his word and through the Holy Spirit. Right? So he has emotions. When we give place to the devil, when we lie or when we sin against God, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. But when we overcome temptations, the Holy Spirit is empowered inside of us. He says, this is the way that you ought to fight the enemy. And he empowers us. He gives us the strength. Right? So for example, if, I, if, if, if a person is a believer and he sins, what happens? He's grieving the Holy Spirit. It's like, for example, you're just building a wall around you. Right? And each time we sin, we're building, you know, we're putting bricks. And what does it do? We are surrounded by this wall, and the Holy Spirit is, we are not able to hear Him. Why? Sin has come. So as believers, very, very important responsibility. It's our responsibility that we do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve Him. Remember that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There will be times, I would say, there are many times I have grieved the Holy Spirit. Maybe I've got upset. Maybe I have, uh, I have said something. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit also brings conviction. So I can go back to the Holy Spirit, go back to God and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. Wash me by your blood. Right? The Bible says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Right? So then D, he can speak. He speaks to us. He expresses himself to us. He speaks through the word. He can speak through dreams, visions. He can speak through a word of knowledge, a prophetic word. How many of you have read 1 Samuel 15? You should read, read about Samuel. Now, this is the ministry in the Old Testament. And how God is so perfectly, through the Holy Spirit, revealing to Samuel what he must do. Samuel is there, he's anointed. You don't have to read it now, you can read it in your break. But he's anointed of God, and Samuel goes and he meets Saul. And he says, Saul, here's what you do. You go up this mountain, you'll meet two people. When you meet those two people, you will, you know, uh, you will, Saul is searching for his father's donkeys. After you meet these two people, one of them will give you bread, one of them will say this, then they will take you up to another place. Very clear direction. From the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can speak to us in that way. He can. He really can. Right? The Holy Spirit can be insulted. He can be blasphemed. Right? They can say, there is no Holy Spirit. Right? There is no God. He can be blasphemed. He can be lied to. Right, and, and so let's go to, sorry, we'll go to point number G. He can be blasphemed. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31. Let's read that. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Uh, 
go ahead anyone can read please therefore i say to you every sin and decency will be forgiven man but the blessing against the spirit will not be forgiven man anyone who speaks a word against the son of man it will be forgiven him but whoever speaks against the holy spirit it will not be forgiven him neither in this age or in the age to come yeah so here jesus is being very clear you can speak about things against god the father or jesus but do not blaspheme the holy spirit in anger in in spite and pettiness sometimes we attribute the work the miracles of god we blaspheme it we 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 you know the word blaspheme is to ridicule to make fun of right uh, and so sometimes we you know we can especially people who are atheists who don't believe in god no matter what you say their mind is made up they don't want to believe that there's a miracle working god right if, for example if a person is blind and he and somebody prays and the lord gives him eyes to see a person who is an atheist or person who does not believe can come up with all kinds of reasons to you know to to say okay no this just happened it's a by chance thing that is what blaspheming the holy spirit when god speaks to us through a prophetic word and and maybe there are times we may you know reject it and say no i don't want this then what happens we are blaspheming the holy spirit right blasphemy is a willful act and not an accidental mistake when we willfully you know deny the work of the holy spirit deny the power of the holy spirit deny the anointing of the holy spirit it becomes blasphemy right blasphemy occurs blasphemy of the holy spirit occurs when one attributes the work of the holy spirit to the devil remember they came to jesus and they said this guy has gone crazy because he is driving out demons through beelzebub which is another demon right here's the thing they could not do it so the person who did it jesus did it instead of you know celebrating what jesus did they're pointing fingers this guy is driving out demons with the help of demons what did jesus say a kingdom divided in itself will not stand how can a demon chase you know uh, chase away another demon but this is the work of god so god is the, the holy spirit is being blasphemed the, the lord jesus is saying when you blaspheme the work of the holy spirit it is going to be a big task it's going to be a sin that will be held against you we thank god right that all of us as believers we believe in the work of the holy spirit we know that the holy spirit is a miracle working god he can do miracles in our life he can change things in our lives there's nothing that he cannot do I share this story i don't normally share this but just to help you understand many years ago uh, i was just a new believer in christ and i had to go to a very far off place to do like a house prayer so i taken my brother's bike now it was a new bike so i just took his bike and i went it was probably about 20 25 kilometers away far away from the city this is in 2007 2008 and so we finished the prayer in the evening and it was getting very late in the night so it was probably about 11 11 30 in the night and i was just getting back home it's a 25 kilometer odd journey right very quiet place right it was like you know interior places and so i got onto the bike and i started riding and you know all of a sudden maybe about a few kilometers down the line the bike stopped I was really scared. I said, how do I get home? One, my parents are going to really shout at me. Two is, how do I get home? There's no petrol bunk. There's nothing around. It's just empty. Right? I said, God, please help me. 
I remember asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I really need your help now. Now is the time. I prayed so much, it started to rain heavily. From bad to worse it became. I said, God, what I meant was do something. Now I'm getting drenched in the rain. I started grumbling. But I remember that it's just stirring in my heart. God is a God of miracles. Romans 4.17, he calls those things that are not there as if they are there. So I got that verse. I said, Holy Spirit, you're inside me. So I'm going to declare this verse. You call those things that are not there as if they are there. So now there's no petrol in this bike. What do I do? This bike, I need to get home. I cannot sleep here. I need to get home. So I opened the tank and I checked, with, you know, it was dry. There was no petrol. So I just sat there praying, praying, praying. Suddenly I just thought, okay, let me start the bike. Tried starting it, nothing happened. I tried starting it again, nothing happened. The third time, and I, it started. I just started riding the bike. I didn't look left and right. Only if I can reach the highway, that's more than enough. And I reached the highway, and it felt like it was maybe five minutes. The next thing I know, I was parking the bike in my house. I thought to myself, hey, I rode 25 kilometers all the way. I thought, well, I didn't fill petrol. And I opened the petrol tank. The petrol came out. It was a full tank of petrol. I thought to myself, now it's not like only HP will make petrol. God is a God who calls those things that are not there as if they are there. Now, you please fill petrol in your bikes and ride. Don't, don't say, God, God will say there's a petrol bomb, fill. What I meant was, it was a situation like that. Is he able to? Is he able to? Or is only God apart from us and he, he does only heavenly things? He's able to. Right? The Holy Spirit inside us can do the work of miracles. Right? All we need to do is believe. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. Although I will for mercy a blessing more a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did. I did it in, ignorantly in unbelief. Right. So now Paul is writing his own testimony. He's saying, 1 Timothy 1.13, he's saying, he's talking about God's grace and anointing upon his life, the calling of God upon his life. He's saying, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and in unbelief. Very important. Paul is saying, even though I was a blasphemer, remember Acts, the book of Acts, what was Paul doing? He made a decision. He said, I'm going to wipe out the religion of Christianity. There's, I don't like this religion. I don't want to hear about this religion. I don't want to see Christians. Give me papers. I'll get into Damascus. I'll wipe out all the Christians. He wanted to you know, just wipe out this religion. How can they come and say the Messiah has come and born and, you know, he died on the cross? I don't like this religion. Even once, even though I was a blasphemer, a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance. Now, there will be times uh, people will act in ignorance. And here comes the mercy of God. Right? Paul experienced full forgiveness for his unintentional sin, and he became the greatest apostle the church has ever seen. Right? So, what is that lesson that we can learn? Yes, we sin. Yes, there are times we fall short, but don't intentionally grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't intentionally do something wrong. Right now, for example, we all have phones. Now, the phone 
We have access to many things. Gone are those days where you have to go to a cyber cafe and remember those days to download your your Marx card. You don't now everything's there on your phone. Now it's a choice. It's a choice with what we see and what we speak. It's our choice. And so sometimes we do things unintentionally. We go back to God and ask forgiveness, but there are times we do we sin intentionally. I will stay away from that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit because He's your mark. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our body is the temple, He resides in us. So we need to honor that. Right? So if there are sins in our life, you know, you can take a moment and say, Holy Spirit. I want to apologize. Please forgive me for my sins. These are things that I have done wrong. You know, the, the psalmist says, our lives are an open book in front of him. Psalms 139 says, I knit you together in my mother's womb. Even before a day came to you, I know all the days of your life. Now, we can't hide from God. God, the Holy Spirit knows. But He's gentle. He's not going to force you. He's going to remind us, okay, this is the thing that you did. Ask God for forgiveness. Right? The Apostle Paul, he acted in ignorance. He's saying, I was once a persecutor. I was once somebody who did not understand. I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. I was standing when, Steve, when they killed Stephen. And he writes in, um, Paul writes in Corinthians, he said, he had blood on his hands. He had killed people in his own hands, but he found the grace of God, the love of God. He found it, right? So remember the Holy Spirit when he's reminding you of things, when he's you know, probably bringing something to your remembrance. Go back. Ask God for forgiveness. Ask God to make, set things right before him at all times, right? I'm not saying we will not fail. We will fail at times, but he gives us the he gives us the grace, he gives us the opportunity to come back. How many of you have heard of Joseph Stalin? Joseph Stalin was a dictator. He killed more than four million people. You know that when he was a young boy, he joined Bible college to become a minister? Joseph Stalin. He finished Bible college, he thought he is God. He finished Bible college and he thought he is God. Instead of the other way around, he became one of the worst dictators, the most you know, cruel, one of the cruel, most cruel dictators to have ever lived, Joseph Stalin. So we can intentionally go against God, or we can say, God, I humble myself. Forgive me of my sins, right? And when we do that, the Holy Spirit begins to work in our life. That's the most beautiful aspect. God in us, the hope of glory, right? Next point, he can be resisted. Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. What is the meaning of resist? What is the meaning of resist? Let's read Acts 7 and 51. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Now Peter's writing and he's, he, Peter's talking there and he's saying, hey, when I stood and I preached the first time, 3,000 people were added. So you're saying that these 3,000 people believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ was it something by fluke? Or was it something that was man-made? 3,000 people were added. Don't you remember that me and Peter and John was going, they were going to the temple and they saw this lame man and he said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. This man who was begging all his life in front of the temple is now you know, jumping around, walking around. What did the, disciple, what did the Pharisees say? Don't do this next time. Who told you to heal on the Sabbath day? 
They did that to Jesus as well. Right? They went to Jesus and said, Who told you to heal on the Sabbath day? Look at that. Instead of looking at the miracle, they're looking at the law. They're saying, This is not allowed. Jesus is saying, I know what I'm doing. I am the Sabbath. So, in our lives, the Holy we can there can be a time when we can resist the Holy Spirit. We can say no to Him. We keep saying no. We keep falling into sin. What happens? We're resisting Him. Saying, I don't want you. I don't need you. And that is a wrong place to be. It's a dangerous place to be. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And we need to be able to you know, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Do not resist the Holy Spirit. There will be times the Holy Spirit will impress on your heart to maybe fast and pray. There will be times when the Holy Spirit will impress on your heart to read the Word. Right? Meditate on God's Word. So you do it. Right? Don't resist because there will be times He wants to speak to you. Right? He wants to minister to you through the Word. That's where we go. So, the Holy Spirit can be resisted. Lastly, He can be quenched. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. The word quenched. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. You know, in a hot sunny day, like maybe you're out playing soccer the whole day, and then in the afternoon, you're so tired and you have this you know, this water, one glass of water, what happens to your soul? What happens to your body? Sorry? What happens? You, you know, you've played for more than two, three hours, and you come and you have a glass of cool drinking water. Feel satisfied. You know, your, your, your thirst is quenched. You feel like you don't need anything more at that moment. You feel satisfied. Here, we can quench the Holy Spirit, meaning we can say, enough Holy Spirit. We can just say, no, I don't need more of you for now. I'll speak to you when I need you. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. So Paul writes in another place, he says, fan into flame. You know, it's like a spark, and then you fan it into flame. It becomes a fire. So the responsibility that you and I have as believers is to fan into flame that spark that the Holy Spirit puts in us. We fan it into flame. we got to fan it. How do I fan it? Spend more time in God's Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in worship. Spend time reading, meditating on God's word. Right? That's how we fan it into flame. Now, if I decide that I don't want to, uh, you know, be, you know, be led by the Holy Spirit, or I just want to live okay normally, then it's fine with God. He's not going to pressure. He's a he's a dove. He's not going to you know override your will. It is our responsibility. Paul, Paul writes in Timothy and he says, you fan it into flame. You, you know, fan it. Make that fire to grow. Don't let it quench. Remember, the enemy, want, he does not want you to walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That is the last thing he wants. Amen? He doesn't want us to, he doesn't want us to believe in the word. He doesn't want us to, you know, to, to walk in that anointing that God has placed in us. Because He knows if we walk in the anointing, His work is destroyed. He knows it. So what does He do? He tries to quench it. So instead of reading the Word, why don't you do something else? Huh? He'll bring replacements. I should share this. I don't normally want to share this, but I'm sharing it. Just so that we get a context. When I joined Bible college, I really wanted to study God's Word. And now, all the other 
like my batch mates, most of them were you know, good, very good guys, very good. But they were all pastors' children. So when they go back home, they have a church to look after. Now, I left a high paying job in a corporate office and I've come to Bible college. So I was really serious. Right? I really wanted to learn. Right? But these guys are all fooling around, doing all kinds of things. So I remember telling God, I need to do something. But most of my time was going with one thing. What was that? Any guesses? Phone. So every time, you know, my office guys, are, office friends are calling and these friends are calling. So I would put it on silent mode and keep it in the cupboard and pray. While praying, what are you thinking? Maybe they called me yesterday. Let me just check. Maybe something emergency. Life is going to end, so I have to go and check. I'll go and check. At one point, for more than um, almost a month, I did not pray. And the Holy Spirit reminded me once. He said, quit what you're doing in the Bible college and go back to what you were doing. I just felt that God is saying, leave, go from here. And there's a very strong stirring. I said, why God? No, no, no. I want to say, said, you're not serious about what you're doing. I was really stirred up in my heart. I said, God... I will change. I took the phone. I went to the restroom. I put the phone in the toilet and I flushed it. No phone for two years. Then I thought I should have removed the SIM card, but it's okay. I flushed it. How to connect with Paul? Don't connect. It's okay. I didn't have a phone for two years. Two years as a student, I didn't have a phone. So how do I... You know, I was in the worship team as a student. You want to meet, you want me to, you email me. No phone, two years. What are you doing? The word. Go back to the word. Go back to God. Say, God, speak, minister to me. I wish I had time to do that now, but I don't have time now. Right? So many things in the church. But what I'm trying to say is, the, the enemy can bring normal things in our life to quench the Holy Spirit. Normal things. It doesn't need to be some satanic work or demonic thing. No. Normal things to quench the Holy Spirit. That is a choice that we have. We must fan into flame. Right? Will we do that? Will we fan into flame? Yes or no? Some of you are like, you do what you want, I'll do what I want. We must do it. I want to encourage you, right? Fan it into flame. Don't be, don't be discouraged. Maybe you're feeling, hey, God, God has never spoken to me. God has never ministered to me. I've never got a dream. I've never got a vision. I've never really understood. Don't be afraid. Start now. It's never too late. Amen? It's never too late. God can restore your time. So take that step. Okay. So shall we get into the next chapter? Any questions? Anyone? Any questions you have? No questions? Then we can go into the next chapter. Just check here. All right. OK, so we'll get into chapter 3, the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Now, before we go ahead, we need to establish this fact. The Holy Spirit, being the third person in the Trinity, is God, right? It's not like he's third in rank, right? He's God in a sense. And the best way to, uh, you know, to, to probably explain a Trinity, one of the, you know, I read this in one of Ravi Zacharias's book, very brilliantly he, he says this. You know, for example, me, right? Paul, I have three roles right now, three or more, but let's take three. Right? I'm a son to my father. Now, the way I am with my parents, I'm a son. Right? I'm the youngest of three children. And even now, I'm 38 years old. 
even now my parents ask me did you have lunch they call and ask did you have breakfast why that's never going to change you become pastor you become prophet you become you, whatever you want to be you be for me you are my son that will never change even now if i get fever they'll be sitting next to me i say go it's okay no they'll be that's never going to change i am a son to them i will always be a son two i am a husband to my wife now the role changes i can't act childish right i can go to my parents you know just act childish with them that's okay but to my wife i should i should know how i am i'm a husband i'm the house of the house and then i'm a father to my children again the role changes same person three roles god is one three in essence so the holy spirit was there from the beginning and now in the old testament he worked in a certain way right and in the new testament he worked in a certain way the way the holy spirit ministers to you may be different to the way the holy spirit ministers to me right it's very it could be very different or it could be similar so we cannot put god in a box and say god you speak to me only in this way it's not going to happen right so now we look at how the holy spirit ministered in the old testament is it the same holy spirit is it something new is the holy spirit uh, you know uh, less power in the old testament more power in the new testament yes or no no it's the same right so how did he minister in the old testament the holy spirit in the old testament was not the same as it was in the day of pentecost now in the old testament all through the uh, the prophets when you see the holy spirit came on people ministered to them gave a prophetic word or a prophetic uh, a word of wisdom word of understanding and left so if you see you know many many places right uh, look at uh, elijah look at david look at daniel right remember daniel daniel is standing there the king says i had a dream now here's the thing to make sure you people are telling the truth i'm not going to tell you what the dream is you tell me the dream and you have to explain the dream to me the other astrologers are saying what are you talking about king how will i tell you your dream so i don't know you are saying you're an astrologer i'm paying you you tell me what it is and then daniel comes into the scene what does daniel say daniel says see uh, king i don't know the dream but one thing i know is i know a god who can tell me the dream and also reveal it to you give me some time daniel chapter 2 i think i think it's daniel chapter 2 he goes back and he prays and towards the end of the prayer he says i thank you god that you have revealed your your wisdom the mysteries to me and he goes in front of the king and he says okay king listen this is your dream this is what he explains the whole dream and the king is surprised he says now i'll tell you what the meaning of the dream is this is what the meaning of your dream is the holy spirit revealed it to him similar story in the life of joseph right now picture this joseph oh man he 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 thought okay things will go well my brothers will bow down to me nothing went well he's in prison he's falsely accused the king has a dream nobody knows what it means they call for joseph joseph comes the holy spirit reveals the dream to him and then the holy spirit gives him the wisdom to how to interpret and what to do next see the work of the holy spirit right so in the old testament he worked in a certain way in the new testament he also worked in a certain way so let's look at some of it the holy spirit as a person did not change but his modus operandi which means his method of working has changed right now 
when we say changed, it only means it has, you know, because now in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is in us, right? So when we say his methods can be very different, can he work like the way he did in the Old Testament? Yes, he can, right? But his methods can vary. Now, let's read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Go ahead. Anyone can read that? The earth was without form and void. The darkness was on the face of deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Wow. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. I mean, the hover means to move. The Hebrew word here means to rakhaf, to brood over, to, to move over. Right, and the Holy Spirit is involved in, in when it comes to even the the birthing of this world, the creation of this world. So here's an important point: we can invite the work of the Holy Spirit to brood over, to hover over people. Right. So, for example, how many of you have been in these evangelistic meetings? Thousands of people. Right, and the preacher or the evangelist, the person who's preaching, will say, "I see this person with the name and with details." He can the the Holy Spirit can point to that singular person, but he can also move over the entire place like wind. Now, for example, if 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 wind comes, can you say, "Hey, wind, don't touch me"? Can you say that? The wind doesn't care. Whether you're there or not there, it's going to it's going to you know blow like water, right? If I go under a tap, take a glass of water, and I switch and I put it on, and I'm holding the glass, I can't say off off in Jesus' name. Will it will it off? No. The nature of water is to flow. It you have to off it. So the same way, the Holy Spirit can hover over people over cities, over regions, like wind and water, just, just flow. It can brood over people. And through the preaching of this word, the Holy Spirit can touch lives and bring many sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. It can, the Holy Spirit can use anything. I remember once we were in a meeting, I think this was in Nasik. Many years ago, and we were doing this meeting, and it was a pastor's meeting. So, during the worship time, right, uh, I remember this uh, there was a projection, right? And one person, he came and gave this testimony after the whole meeting in Nasik. He came and he said, You know, I became a believer this during these two days' meeting. So, we asked him, How? You won't believe what he said. I mean, it was so interesting. I've never heard a testimony like this. He said he actually came in to cause trouble or to, you know, to just see what's happening. And, and so when he came in, he was sitting and listening to the songs. And in the songs, in the projection, there was a cross that was, you know, these new PPTs, I'm not too technical, but the new uh, PPTs, Easy Worship, they have those, you know, moving. Uh, stuff happening in the in the lyrics. So there was a cross that was like moving front and back. And so this guy had come in and he's only looking at the cross. He doesn't know any song. He's from another faith. He's he's just looking at the cross and that cross captivated him. What's so why is that cross speaking to me so much? And the Holy Spirit used the cross on the PPT to change his life. He said he, accept, he accepted the Lord Jesus. He said, I saw that cross. I don't understand what the cross is, but something happened in my spirit where I felt that all the weight of my sins, all the things that I did, everything has been removed. I feel like I've, you know, my life has changed just by looking at that cross. So the Holy Spirit can hover over, over people in different ways. And sometimes you, we cannot stop that flow, right? 
Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. Let's read that. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not stream with man forever, for he is indeed at flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. The Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. Meaning what? The Holy Spirit will come, be minister, and go back. And that's what God had designed for the Old Testament. In Genesis 41 and verse 38, again, Joseph was empowered to interpret dreams through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit revealed what the dream was, and he was able to uh, you know, just explain that dream. Exodus 28 and verse 3, let's read that. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 3. So you shall speak to all who are gifted, Artians who I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may that they may make Aaron Aaron's uh, garments to concentrate uh, him, that he may minister to me as priest. Yeah. Now let me give you a context, and then we'll just take a break. The context here is the people of Israel have come out of Egypt and they are still in the wilderness. And in the wilderness, God is establishing many things. What is he doing? He's doing the he's establishing the covenants, he's establishing the offerings, the guilt offering, pain offering, all of these offerings. And now he's establishing the whole thing of sacrifice, right? And he says, Choose Aaron as your high priest. Now, God is very particular about certain things if you read the old testament it's just a brilliant explanation of who god is to the minute detail he says you know while building the ark of the covenant he says this is what you must do you should take this kind of wood this is the size of the wood this is the uh, the length this is the breadth this is what uh, how you should place it these are the colors of the curtains. These are the color of the cloth. And so now in chapter 28, God is saying, okay, Moses, I'm going to anoint few people and I will give them the spirit where through the Holy Spirit, a skill where they will be able to come up with the garments for the high priest. Right? And so they do that. God gives them the wisdom to come up with, you know, what they should wear. Probably, you know, the, the, the whole thing, the, the vest, the, um, the, the stones uh, signifying the 12 tribe, tribes of Israel, everything through the wisdom of God. Right? God, through His Spirit, gave special ability to specific people in building the tabernacle, its furniture, and for the garments that the priests had to wear. Everything was through the leading and anointing of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we may think, why do you need anointing for that? You need it. God was so meticulous. He needed it to be this way. And he got it done that way. Can you imagine this? God comes to Noah and says, build an ark. Noah is saying, what is the meaning of ark? He didn't know what's an ark. It never rained before that. And God is saying, okay, you build it this way. And if you read that, it's it's just so brilliant because God gives him the specifics. How high, how wide, how deep, what are the compartments in the ark, everything. God gives it. And it is all through the, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right? Let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll continue from where we are.